everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased that I can moderate this session of Hong Kong Horizontal Metropolis. Um, this is a, um, I think, third webinar uh, related to an exhibition um, that is currently going on in the City Gallery in Hong Kong and uh, was particularly also put together um, by, I think, I, but, uh, also Gianni yeah. uh, Salamini, who's sitting with us. Um, I think maybe, can I ask uh, Peter maybe to mute himself for the moment? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, today there will be two sessions <clears throat> on territory, and this is uh, the first session, and the later session will be then at uh, 5 p.m. Hong Kong time, as far as I understand right. Uh, my name is Hendrik Thieven. I'm from the School of Architecture at Chinese University of Hong Kong. And we will have um, four speakers for this session, uh, and then uh, Q&A and discussion at the end. Um, as you can see, we have basically all speakers here. So um, the first talk, talk will be delivered by Johnny Talamini, uh, followed by Peter Hassel, then by Peter Cookson Smith, and by John Chang He. Um, without further ado, maybe I go to the introduction of the first uh, speaker, Johnny Talamini. Um, as far as I know, uh, most people should have the, uh, the bios of every speaker. So I think in view of time, I will not read the entire CV. Uh, just saying that uh, uh, Johnny, of course, was very uh, critical in, in putting together the, the exhibition um, in uh, uh, Hong Kong. And uh, he's uh, teaching at uh, City University of Hong Kong where he's leading the urban design and regional planning program. Um, and I think his presentation is titled Water Engineering and Landscape in the Greater Bay Area. And uh, through that also further developing this idea of the horizontal metropolis. So I think it would be a very good introduction to this session. So without further ado, Johnny, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hendrik. And uh, thank you all for being here today. I will share my screen. Um, speaker after. Uh, um, I think you're gonna see it now, right? Yeah, we, yeah, to keep okay, it perfect. Know, 15 minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your introduction, Hendrik. And um, um, it's an honor for me to be here today. Uh, it's an honor to speak after so many uh, outstanding scholars that has been that have been shaping my own career development, my own research throughout time, and many of those were actually presenting in previous sections, uh, and of course Paula Viganò, uh, who inspired um, this uh, whole project uh, and has been leading as well it, um, but uh, many others uh, from Sebastian Maro. Uh, to Alan Berger and uh, to Kelly Shannon with their work on a notion uh, of water uh, urbanism and many others that are not here today, like Dennis Cosgro, uh, who um, uh, this speech is dedicated to, and obviously the title is a reference, a reference to one of his uh, most famous uh, work. Um, as Paula, I like to travel by train. I like to see uh, the uh, surrounding landscape. And this is the first level for me of inquiry into the territories that we are uh, living on a daily basis. And uh, these are photographs that have been taken uh, uh, while uh, crossing the Pearl River Delta, what nowadays we call the Greater Bay Area, um, going from different centralities. And to what I notice is that uh, uh, what we see here as uh, Forward by MG, for instance, uh, is somehow uh, common to many other places in Asia, and uh, in particular East Asia. And East Asia is undergoing a progressive degradation of agricultural land on its fringe and in between mega cities. Uh, in these peri urban areas, the expansion of unregulated urban oriented activities produce contamination of soil and the pollution of water resources, threatening the health of local population and 
ecosystems. While these regions are central in the global process of urbanization and their population are expected to grow, 100 million people over the next decade, uh, there are still no governmental plans or comprehensive strategy to halt environmental degradation and to prevent associated threat to expanding populations. Uh, what you see here is a sort of uh, horizontal metropolis of the Greater Bay Area. Uh, it's made of different kind of materials that are just supposed uh, one on top of each other, uh, water, definitely, uh, agriculture, and uh, infrastructure uh, that are connecting uh, all these territories and, uh, and into this notion of uh, Greater Bay Area. But as well, uh, I've been observing um, this transformation from a different perspective. Uh, and I try to conceptualize what I've seen from uh, remote sensing. As Alan Berger was conceptualizing the notion of Drosscape by observing uh, the territory when, uh, of the American cities while doing other actually research, he was flying over uh, this um, unutilized or so, sort of underutilized territories of the American uh, metropolis. Um, in the same way, I tried to use remote sensing to understand the degree of, uh, um, of transformation and this very fast, this outstanding transformation that is going on here and has been going on in the last decade. So this was, this is the Peri River Delta. Uh, this was the Peri River Delta in uh, November, uh, 1988, and this is uh, uh, this is the Peri River Delta right now, or just few few years ago. Um, this astonishing uh, growth of uh, of urbanized areas are obviously tapping into former agricultural land, are obviously producing fruits to different kind of uh, natural resources in this area. Uh, but also, I've been using different kind of instruments like drones to understand how this transformation was actually happening, how this transformation was actually taking place. And I observed that these uh, very, uh, very peculiar forms that we call uh, fish, um, uh, like form in of, this, uh, of these agricultural parcels in the new territories of Hong Kong has been uh, gradually, gradually transforming into other kind of uh, use, other, into other kind of land uses, as you see on the top left uh, of this image, and then um, there are different kind of um, functions that are tapping in uh, from car parks uh, that are mixing with the graves, uh, the graveyard that you see on the bottom left of this image as well, uh, to other kind of, of uh, land use like residential uh, or uh, what we call nowadays brownfields. Uh, in other terms, uh, the um, this, uh, sprawl, I would say, or the diffusion uh, of the um, industrial related or port related activities into former agricultural land. Um, obviously, this is absolutely interesting. But on the, other, on the other hand, what I've been noticing and trying to understand is how uh, these new sedimentations uh, somehow keep uh, a sort of memory in their form of previous uh, cultivated area, of previous transformation of the landscape uh, that were uh, shaping this uh, this territory, and they are mixing with them uh, in very uh, strange and sometimes uh, fascinating uh, manners. Um, this is a residential, uh, a new residential unit, uh, just just opposed to a sort of uh, natural development or more like, uh, uh, and this is uh, more natural development, I would say, and this is a so sort of combination of these many different pieces. Of, of land that uh, are uh, um, in a way mixing there. The rural urban transformation of the lowlands in the new territories of Hong Kong uh, from 1960s to the present uh, has been in a way uh, announcing what is also happening uh, at the moment in many other areas of the Pearl River Delta. And that's why I start to focus on that and trying to uh, use this as a, as a revelatory case to understand uh, how this uh, this transformation has been happening in the last uh, half a century there. So this is a typical image of the traditional uh, agricultural land as it was looking like uh, in 1946-47 uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, this was like obviously the very traditional 
form uh, that uh, was inspiring this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, anthropogenic transformation of the landscape. Um, there, are, uh, there were rows of terrace paddy fields uh, there were, um, they are still common in many other areas of China, and there's, they are a symbol of the agrarian society in this part of the world. Um, in, this example in the new territories of Hong Kong was photographed half a century ago, at the, about the time that uh, uh, this development has been boosted by uh, a lot of migrants that came into, uh, into the, uh, the, the city of Hong Kong. So this was the landscape before, and this is the same picture right now. So what happened? Um, what I've been trying to understand is actually uh, this, and are actually the reason of this transformation, but also uh, what are the underpinning uh, uh, somehow criteria for uh, this occupation of land. Uh, so after uh, undertaking several years of research and field work, I have hypothesized that in peri-urban areas, top-down flood control schemes employing stream channelization cause significant degradation of both social, cultural, and biophysical aspects of repairing agriculture, creating favorable conditions for the expansion of unregulated urban-oriented activities. And second, that the stream renaturation can regenerate or uh, generate a partial recovery of riparian degraded landscape, fostering bottom-up farming, land care, as well as reconstructing a sense of belonging to water courses. So I've been looking into that through different kind of work um, and uh, particularly using uh, secondary data from, uh, from Hong Kong government and understanding that these uh, this, uh, occupy warehouse and open storage occupy a very large portion of, of the urbanized land in Hong Kong uh, and uh, uh, we have been looking into that through an exhibition that was presented at UABB uh, four years ago. Uh, and uh, we have been understanding that uh, uh, the process of peri-urbanization that is transforming East Asia is particularly relevant in the mega urban uh, regions such as uh, the Wolper River Delta, but in particular, uh, it becomes evident in these places, in this uh, sort of desert quota. Uh, that uh, is in between centralities. Uh, so uh, all this uh, land were uh, previously agriculture and then um, abandoned, abandoned gradually and uh, give place to uh, a huge amount of what we call once more brownfield, but actually a better definition would be um, non-conforming land uses uh, of the four main different types, storage, container yard, parking lots, and uh, and classified or uh, like, uh, somehow different kind of activities that comes together there. And we map that, as you see here, understanding that uh, they occupied the same amount of land as the whole urbanized area of the uh, Hong Kong Island. So it's a huge amount of land that obviously uh, it is becoming a resource for now the redevelopment and uh, offer of uh, different kind of uh, residential units and possibly expansion of urban areas into uh, into this former agricultural land. So this is their location, uh, uh, superimposing uh, this uh, these areas with the map of uh, the um, vegetated area in the lowland. It's obvious that this is actually happening into agricultural land, into a former agricultural land. Uh, and then uh, we've been understanding or trying to understand the relationship between uh, stream uh, renaturations, uh, sorry, stream channelization and uh, this development. So finding out that obviously there is, from this image, it's very clear, a, a sort of uh, association between this transformation of the river and the, the, the spread of this, uh, of this brown field. Then I'll go quite quickly through this part. Uh, this shows uh, the initial uh, um, uh, setting, settling of this of two new town uh, in uh, quite quite important obviously in the new territories of Hong Kong. One is uh, Yuan Long, and the other one is in Shui Wei, and uh, uh, they occupy this area, this portion that was all agriculture, as you can see here, uh, and uh, they, they are the back area right in the middle of this uh, of this image, uh, and they were planned. Uh, by, uh, in a way, um, defining, defining an area of intervention 
uh, that was very limited to the central part of the new town without understanding or trying to understand how this development would take place uh, at largely and, and would um, symbiotically uh, uh, relate with the, the rest of the territory that surrounded it. So um, this area is planned to become, I'm quoting now, um, beginning of the quote, this area is planned to become increasingly urbanized with agricultural use eventually being phased out and replaced by industrial and residential areas centering on the district center, uh, the planning strategy also proposed a hierarchy of rural center to be expanded depending on priority. And as well as work, uh, end of the quote, beginning of the quote, works for uh, 43 CD and 30 CD will not result in any insurmountable environmental problem, end of the quote. What we see here is that this process of urbanization came together with the training of the, uh, of the river, of the former uh, like natural kind of natural uh, streams that were crossing this area into channels that uh, are meant to control uh, floating issues uh, that obviously were uh, affecting very heavily this territory, but in a way also boosting the process of uh, physical transformation of this area, boosting the process of occupation of this former agricultural land by different kind of land uses, as we saw before. This is an image that clearly show what is the situation nowadays with a, a big uh, concrete channel that cross the wall valley and uh, and somehow have this uh, uh, two different type of image. One very dry for most of the year and one full of water just when uh, the rain come and for the few next hours. Uh, we have been once more understanding and I will go quickly here, all the policies that are related to this transformation from the Ding House or the possibility for uh, male um, uh, sons to build their own little house uh, and, and create a sort of sprawl around original villages. We have been analyzing this in more um, uh, in a more large way by looking at uh, type of morphological units of this village, but as well as how uh, these four control systems um, and particularly the dam that has been built around the villages uh, has been creating uh, the condition for once more uh, this sort of transformation that was already well introduced and well expressed by uh, the uh, middle Mississippi River uh, uh, cross section by uh, Cosgro and that's on the uh, on the bottom right of this image. So once more, uh, we have been trying to conceptualize this and understand how this has been uh, related to a sort of paradigm shift in which uh, float control on one side and mobility transformation on the other uh, has been creating once more a very fast uh, sp spread of uh, the uh, urban related activities. So in, uh, to summarize somehow, in East Asia, rural urban transformation needs to be discussed as a vicious cycle of hydrologic alteration, environmental degradation and destructive land use changes, all of which jeopardize millions of people's lives. In particular, top-down flood control schemes has been linked to significant degradation of both socioeconomic and biophysical features of rural landscape, as well as the speeding up of agricultural decline and environmental degradation. Uh, we have been looking more analytically into some of these cases by, by using a control group and an experimental group. This is the case of Um Shui Q, I mean the experimental group. We have been using aerial photographs and we've been analyzing them, uh, analyzing the different, uh, the different occupation of this territory by uh, by unauthorized land use or non-conforming land use uh, and uh, mapping this through time and understanding, you see the experimental group on the left, that the channelization of the river had a huge impact, had a huge impact on uh, this uh, rapid transformation of the territory. Uh, this is more quantitative uh, related analysis and you can see once more uh, when the river training comes then there is obviously a degradation, immediate degradation of agricultural um, uh, land and uh, the occupation of uh, this territory by different kind of land uses. You see it is more clear on the left, uh, left hand side, the percentage of non-conforming land use. And you see the sharp increase that is due to river channelization. I'm coming one minute, I will, yeah. 
Thank you, Andrew, for your reminder. Um, so uh, on the left, you see all these. Then a few other research uh, very quickly through this in, in Shenzhen. Uh, and recently, uh, Shenzhen has been undertaking the redevelopment of this channel for flood control purposes as well, but as well as for uh, wastewater management, building underground um, uh, culverts on both bank of the river. So we have been studying this uh, with my research team, understanding how uh, this has been also linked to the possibility of reusing the river in a very different way. So uh, the river became green uh, and there is an ongoing process of transformation with excellent uh, examples uh, like Futiang River, for instance. This is Dasha, Dasha, Dasha River. And uh, these places become places of sociability uh, and uh, they become um, places in which people meet, people uh, encounter. We've been studying that using drone, using um, behavioral uh, maps to understand how people has been uh, um, using this. Uh, I'll quickly go through the end. Uh, last but not least, I've been using, uh, we've been uh, looking at all the relevant literature about the social aspect of uh, river uh, renaturation, uh, screening almost 1,000 uh, 1, uh, works uh, and uh, trying to understand uh, the relation uh, and uh, I mean their location where they are produced uh, by who and, uh, and looking at the increase over time. So there is a lot of interest in these aspects. We are actually focused right now on this in a very uh, in a very interdisciplinary manner as it emerged from, from this. Uh, to conclude, We've, uh, we've uh, witnessed a transformation of river from uh, water provision, waterways to flood channel, sewers, and uh, finally to amenities. Uh, the question is, what's gonna be next? And I don't have an answer to this question, but definitely what I, uh, I have is a very, um, um, a very deep uh, uh, attachment to these places as I've been living with them and also uh, I'm carrying out a sort of wish of uh, a sensitivity for uh, for ecological uh, issue. Thank you very much, and sorry for taking too much time. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gianni, for this presentation, and uh, uh, particularly also seeing <clears throat> your work developing over the last uh, years here in Hong Kong, <clears throat> really investigating the, the water ecology in the new territories as a, as a very important, very crucial hard and then really making a big contribution to to that particular perspective that is so central i think to to new territories but um urban design landscape uh, and urbanism in general right um particularly also in this part of the world now i come to the uh, second uh, speaker uh peter hassel um who is the associate dean of the school of design of Hong Kong Polytechnic University. So we have basically, I think, four universities here together today in Hong Kong, which is great to see. And uh, um, you you might have uh, his, his CV there, uh, uh, but I just wanna um, highlight that Peter is uh, uh, working um, uh, recently uh, quite intensively with um, TU Delft together in the context of IFO where Actually, we also had a workshop together in 2013, also with Peter, uh, on uh, the more kind of regional uh, changes, both in uh, Hong Kong, but then recently also particularly in the Greater Bay Area. And as far as I understand, you are basically taking us now uh, from Hong Kong also to the GBA, the Greater Bay Area, uh, with your presentation, Ecosystems Logics of liminal urbanisms and urban heterogeneities, uh, Hong Kong and the GBA. So without further ado, Peter, you have the word. Yes, thank you, Hendrik. Thank you very much, also Gianni and, and um, Andrea for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me in advance, because this will be slightly having a detour through uh, some of my prehistory, just so I can speak about uh, one concept that I was part of development, which is kind of liminal bodies or liminal urbanism. I will skip this part. This is uh, the overall thing, but I will just take a slight detour back to where I first began to be heavily involved in urbanism. <laughs> this is through my work in Cora Institute of Architecture and Urbanism between 94 and 2001. 
This was a, a UK-based organization set up by Roel Bunshoten in 1993. And we were uh, basically looking at urban transformation on a very, very large scale uh, post-Soviet Union and also at the same time as uh, European Union was um, uh, consolidating in this way. And a lot of the issues that we were looking at were not necessarily handled very well by um, conventional planning within a nation state or within a city itself. Uh, so then certain things such as uh, strategic spatial planning was in, in its infancy, at least in Europe uh, as, a, as a case. Um, so these things uh, were changing very, very rapidly, how to deal with cross-border kind of development, urban development and so forth. But for CORA itself, um, our, our process is perhaps a, a little bit more uh, speculative in this way. So we were trying to understand, let's say, urban dynamics. In other words, the processes of changes and what some of those factors that were uh, really influencing change uh, outside of the recognized uh, rubrics of um, conventional planning itself. Um, <clears throat> so for instance, if there is a particular phenomenon that happens uh, across the border, but that affects a particular city. How, how do we start to deal with that? How do we start to understand that? Or if there's something that is very, very unrecognized, for instance, the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union led to very, very rapid changes in, in both the economics, the social matrix, the, the kind of organization and operation of cities, as well as planning procedures. So Cora, for instance, was, uh, in the beginning was heavily influenced, interested, sorry, in the, the procedures of change, urban transformation. These are very abstract models that we've done very early. And then we structured these into some kind of um, uh, operational model that we could then go out and look, do field work, speak to people, understand the different procedures and processes of change, which we call proto-urban conditions. Often these were sort of liminal, uh, by liminal, I mean, you know, on the periphery of, of uh, conventionally understood factors, but they, as I mentioned, they often lead to change. So for instance, one of the places we studied, I won't go into much detail, was a small town, half a million called Alexandrov, which was near Moscow. We went there in 92 or 93. So it's only a year or two after the Soviet Union dissolved. Um, so there was no food within a year and a half. There was no food, no, no jobs, no economy, no city management of any of these systems, no planning, state-owned enterprises barely worked. Uh, and there was a, a huge, very quickly, very quick reconfiguration of the way the city operated and developed. So what we did was try to understand some of these procedures, how the city then uh, quickly adapted to a sort of um, doubled in size, in other words, because then rural agriculture or dacha uh, operations, growing your own chickens and, and vegetables uh, became the new economy. And then that led to sort of instant sort of uh, formulation of marketplaces, places of exchanges that were not part of the original city development. So for us, this was just a pr process of learning, uh, mapping, understanding, and then beginning to, to think about how can we restructure some of these conditions within urban development itself. Later on, then we had other commissions or research projects uh, looking at places such as Linz in Austria, where we try to uh, formulate these things within a kind of game boarding situation involving different stakeholders, uh, in the attempt to kind of develop new forms of planning that could also deal with these issues, whether it's in a more regulated city or a, a much more uh, deregulated place. So this is part of Linz's uh, former industry area that we were looking at the mechanisms, the procedures, the links, the relationships that would allow us to uh, apply some of this thinking. It didn't necessarily replace conventional planning it acted as a sort of supplement to some of those things. Um, through this, then we developed a, a kind of extensive game boarding involving many stakeholders and also 
began to understand that uh, within this groups of stakeholders, we um, were developing groups of stakeholders that could be constituted as a sort of temporary or liminal body, liminal organization that actually steer particular aspects of that change through certain processes. These may be cultural institutions, they may be planning organization, community, uh, and so on, but they, they have different roles in different times. So the, the sort of idea of a static or statutory plan, then we would start to critique and change and modify this uh, towards the, the sort of um, choreographed, sequenced action plan, as we call it, or sometimes dynamic plan, involving uh, a multitude of mini scenarios as we as we also termed it. <clears throat> now these would have uh, different constituent roles in this according to different stakeholder groups, different issues, and then uh, allow for a certain kind of uh, both spatial and temporal sequencing in versions such as this that would then we could say this is what we understand through field work. This is the potentials of the ways that this could unfold or change uh, as the city develops itself, uh, leading to a certain kind of time-based scripting or choreographing, a sort of certain form of urban curation that, that lead to multiple possible outcomes rather than a singular one. This leads me to a uh, second um, part of the research, which I did with Joshua Boltova. Uh, both of us had worked for Cora in, in London at different times. <clears throat> so when we both moved to Hong Kong in 2008, we started collaborating shortly afterwards uh, on a, a research study on the Hong Kong Shenzhen border. Um, in, particular, in particular on the, the sort of what was called the frontier closed area, which was an area separated from both cities um, for about 50 years, but still had a, a lot of kind of uh, interaction, historical connection, and uh, was essential towards the maintenance of one country, two systems. Um, so what we, we underwent in this case was a, a, a lot of in-depth field work in these places, which I won't go into detail, but just to mention that this underpins uh, what is perhaps a speculative form of, of research based on scenarios uh, and the scenarios then are underpinned by that research itself. We published this in a, a book called uh, Border Ecologies, published by De Greater uh, Berkhausen in 2016. It was GRF funded, uh, for those of you who know the Hong Kong system. Um, uh, this also speaks towards a certain kind of uh, mechanisms of uh, differentiation between cities, between different urban areas and settlements within the whole GBA. Uh, this may be SARs, SEZs, former concession ports, and so forth, as well as a, a number of anomalies and exceptions, such as the frontier closed area, the, the different uh, languages, cultures, um, economic systems, and so forth. So if, if you look at the whole GBA, it is not a uniform uh, development paradigm, even though parts of it seem very generic in, in the mainland part itself, but actually comprises of a whole series of very, very different urban agglomerations or urban developments um, that, that is quite fascinating when you look at them and how they in intersect, how they align across borders such as this is, uh, um, or across urban edges is quite essential for our understanding in my view. So with this particular project with Joshua, what we did was start to try to understand the, the ecological, okay, ecological mappings, the, the relationships across the borders that actually created liminal conditions, liminal uh, groups, um, how all the different stakeholders had quite different relationships across these, depending where and in what capacity you looked, uh, whether they're operating tactically, strategically, uh, infrastructurally, and so on. So this is part of our mappings. This is some of the, the parts in the book itself. 
where we try to uh, understand, for instance, cross-border school kids or parallel traders uh, operating across this uh, particular discontinuity or within places like uh, Shadowcock where, where there was a sort of open market for many, many years that actually formed uh, unique spatial conditions, um, both within the settlement itself, but also within the region historically and so forth. And then try to speculate with these in terms of uh, speculative scenarios that, that could then um, unfold potentials of, of the research we found. Finally, um, I want to move into the third part, which is what Henrik talked about, where within School of Design, both myself and uh, Dr. Gerhard Brains have been looking at uh, uh, future scenarios for Hong Kong and also the Greater Bay Area, together with TU Delft, with uh, Diego, Luisa, and Chinle uh, since 2019. So we've set up a kind of collaborative framework that also works with the IFOU as mentioned before. Now, this is a sort of research and master's studio that we started out some years back looking at speculative scenarios for Hong Kong. What if Hong Kong doubles, for instance? How do we then accommodate those things through uh, research, but also through strategic positionings? Um, and then working with uh, our students and researchers in a way that actually could uh, develop a kind of speculative methodology learning from previous uh, researchers that we all had. So what this resulted in with the collaboration with TU Delft was uh, a sort of um, uh, a, a planning approach um, using um, a, a series of, <coughs> excuse me, tools that I've mentioned, such as the game boarding, such as how we can actually play out these different uh, scenarios uh, both on a tactical but also strategic level to develop uh, scenarios that could encompass possible futures for the GBA. Further than that, then this is important that this then uh, results in particular approach that is methodological. In other words, we can actually frame this as potentially applicable for other places. So we really want to look at how we prototype uh, different uh, urban outcomes, different urban scenarios and proposals in very, very um, rough ways that eventually become more um, refined and more complete. So what I'm going to show is not really the whole project here. We don't have sufficient time here, um, but it's just outlined some of these things and how we've <clears throat> incorporated either parts of my research. This one's from Cora, for instance, or the work I did with Joshua, uh, and also from uh, Dr. Gerhard Bryant, uh, which actually relates to his expertise on morphology, where we're actually looking at, uh, looking at urban growth and how that impacts, how that can actually unfold, develop, and the principles of that. One key thing that, just to return to this, is um, the, you know, the very rudimentary work, but in the, the Rem Kuhas Great Leap Forward uh, book on Shenzhen uh, back in, I'm not sure when it was, 19, early 90s, where they were talking about exacerbated difference. In other words, that um, there's a sort of need for avoiding a very generic type of urbanism, uh, and that, that actually this difference leads to a sort of greater understanding of the ecology within urban conditions. So to just wrap this up, what I wanna do is to just outline very quickly what we've been doing for the past three years in School of Design. Sorry, the time is already up, but- uh, Okay, just last three yeah, slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. this is our process. So what we do is actually work very, very physically with the whole GBA area. It scales at one to 200,000 and then later on one to 20,000. Uh, that allow the students or the researchers to really manipulate their data. But this is built on earlier spatial analysis of different conditions. Again, I'm not going into detail on this, but then uh, the, those groups then iterate various thematics on this. There's four different uh, thematics outlined here, for instance, um, that then become through later iteration more 
uh, developed in terms of clustering, in terms of uh, urban sequencing and st strategy, uh, and then eventually end up with much more coherent, consistent uh, design approaches. If you're interested, you can find much more information in the website called Delta Mega Regions, which is our collaborative re uh, website with TU Delft. Finally, just, just to conclude, liminal urbanisms and urban heterogeneities are constituent factors in urban growth, in my opinion. We need those for diversity, but also resilience. This requires, uh, as planners and urbanists, requires from us new analytic approaches, new speculative and scenario-driven planning modalities and methods that are open-ended. Uh, eventually, like should such things be implemented, they would require new forms of governance, policy, application, et cetera. Um, and the, the sort of ecosystemics of these uh, need to extend way beyond the, the, the planning document itself, the, the sort of uh, statutory plans or the strategic urban plans. In other words, that those things could encompass uh, stakeholders, change, dynamics, et cetera. I'm sorry, I didn't talk much about horizontality, but everything here somehow relates to uh, our, my studies on ground plane. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. And uh, very interesting to see this art from your, your early work uh, with Cora and how that basically then evolved into the work of the uh, close frontier area first, not between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, and then now in the DBA, right? Uh, great. Um, sorry sorry uh, for going over time. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. Just I'm, a, I'm aware this is really the, an hour and a half lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, firstly, I'm fine, but it's more my, my job today to, to look into this. Uh, and also, my reminder maybe for the next two speakers uh, to be uh, uh, pretty much on time because we're already um, beyond the, the, the time that was given before. Anyway, I want to come to our third speaker, which is uh, Peter Cookson Smith. Um, Peter Cookson Smith, uh, to people here in Hong Kong, is of course uh, very well known because uh, of his role as president of HKIP, the, the Institute of Planners, and then later uh, uh, one of the founders and also then president of the Hong Kong Institute of Urban Design. Uh, he's also has uh, taught uh, extensively at uh, Hong Kong U, is the author of various uh, books uh, uh, related to urbanism and urban design and urban thinking. Um, and uh, just maybe as last point, maybe interesting uh, in this context, also with his work as a director at Urbis, uh, has actually uh, uh, shaped some of the, the landscapes, I would say, here in this area. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember talking with him about uh, the way how landscape and, and cycling routes and so on were laid out from Shatin to uh, Taipo and so on. So, so parts of the, I think it's a positive, interesting ways of, of uh, really interacting and actually forming this territory. Um, so I would say without further ado, um, Peter, you have the word. <laughs> right, can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Yes. Yep, okay. Uh, well, first, it's nice to uh, to, to join the <coughs> Horizontal Metropolis Network. Um, reading the book that Gianni kind of gave me the other day, uh, this one, yeah. Um, I, I, I do have to agree with um, one of the statements that's made uh, in the introduction, the notion of an increasingly dense isotropic urban condition where there is a blurring between center and periphery. Um, and nowhere more so than in Asia, which is what I'm going to talk about today, really. I'm afraid I don't have a PowerPoint. I do have a longer PowerPoint, but it would take long, so long to go through. Hendrik will be waving at me for another two hours. Um, I, I ha have, I suppose, also got to confess to a somewhat lengthy residence in, in Asia. The date of my first arrival in Hong Kong was the 9th of September, 1976. So that makes it exactly 45 years ago uh, to this month. In fact, that particular day marked a certain watershed in China's history, um, not so much for my rather inauspicious arrival to carry out a project for my then London firm, um, but because while I was sitting on a plane over Southern China, uh, Mao Zedong, who of course uh, had held absolute power over events in China uh, since 1941, 
1949, had passed away in Beijing. It was, of course, the very turbulent years um, um, since that time that Mao had brought many Chinese immigrants and refugees to Hong Kong, and indirectly had, had sort of uh, created the reason for my own arrival in Hong Kong. Um, at the time, to all intents and purposes, Asia had only one fully developed post-war economy, and that was Japan. There were what we then called the four little dragon economies, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. Um, others had very little in the way of international um, economies, uh, but still others, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, um, were in the middle of post-war reconciliation and renewal. So Asia at that time was a very um, interesting uh, 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 state of affairs. Uh, I wrote my own book about six years ago called that. It's the Urban uh, Design of Intervention um, about imposed and adaptive places in, in Asian uh, metropolitan areas and cities. But the past forms a sort of short introduction to the present, really. What is happening in Asian cities and what priorities do we set for design and development? Um, the term city is, um, well, I suppose we all have our own definitions, um, but it is derived essentially from the root word for civilization. It means befitting a citizen. And in general, cities are the result of people's very persistent uh, uh, efforts. Um, uh, to bring about a more livable urban environment. But wherever they are, uh, this is indispensable to the development of society. Edward Glazer in Triumph of the City, which I'm sure everybody's read here, stated that studying cities is so engrossing because they pose fascinating but often troubling questions. And the first question he raises, um, which always rings a bell with me, is why do so many smart people enact so many foolish urban policies? So the, I think this subject is, is very pertinent. Any design model for the Asian, the Asian livable city, at any rate, really must focus on the long-term well-being of its citizens. Um, and planning policies must be sensible, they must be well thought out, they must be acceptable to stakeholders, and most importantly, they must be doable. And these are all things we've sort of found out sometimes to our cost through 45 years of, of, of planning urban design and landscape projects in the region. So today I, I'd like to talk less about um, Hong Kong and really more about Asia as a whole. This has been called the Asian century because metropolitan expansion across Asia has been a story of the, of the post-war years. Asia is an evocative umbrella really for what is uh, in practice quite massive diversity in terms of geographic spread, um, cultural patterns, density, complexity of traditions, overlapping ethnic patterns, um, all embodied in what, what the Horizontal Metropolis book actually says, a very heterogeneous geographic area. It contains about 4.1 billion people. That's equal to about 60% of the planet's population, covers 27 million square kilometers, Two largest countries, obviously, are China and India, which together make up about 2.6 billion. That's half of Asia's entire population. The metropolitan regions of some of our largest cities generate anything between 35 and 60 percent of their national GDP. On top of that, development corridors are expanding well beyond metropolitan boundaries. They're emphasizing the megacity dimensions, in fact, of the urbanization process. The Pearl River Delta, um, right on Hong Kong's doorstep, has a population of some 60 million um, urban residents in its integral cities. And along with the Yangtze Delta metropolitan region, which is centered on Shanghai, these together hold about 80% of China's total foreign investment. In fact, if we simply talk about the greater Bay Area economy as a whole, it would be about the, uh, the, 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 the uh, one, one, of the, one of the eight most the um, uh, uh, largest uh, G GDPs in the world. And this indicates that Asian cities are in a, an almost constant process of regeneration and expansion. And they're also in a, in a almost a continual uh, state of change. Um, Peter mentioned uh, Rem, Rem Koulis. I have my own quote for Rem Koulis. Uh, he says that Asia has this tenuous quality of unrest, which makes previous 
configurations expendable, but also each future state provisional. And I think this might be assumed as somewhere between impermanence and um, indeterminacy. It's something that poses a continual headache to us as urbanists and planners who, and, you know, notoriously like to know exactly where, where we're all heading, where countries are heading, both politically and economically. And this in itself requires some understanding of historical, cultural, political dynamics that have really created the physical condition for the, for the modern nation city. Um, so can we then extract uh, from the residue of all these urban imprints something that addresses the whole, how places look, uh, how they work, what sustains them? Um, I think firstly, it's necessary to look backwards as, as, as well as forward. Um, prior to the European arrival in Asia, and I do think that's a very predominant thing if we do look at Asian history, um, urban settlement types of very uh, different natures have flourished for many hundreds of years. Um, the oldest being the sacred settlement, which served as a capital, a religious focus, an organizational center in terms of agricultural development and overseas trade routes. Um, cities such as um, Ankar in Cambodia, Ayatollah in Thailand, Long Pravang in Laos, Borobudur in Java, along with Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, functioned as essentially symbolic hubs of almost divine authority. The second type of settlement was not surprisingly the port city, uh, which acted as uh, very much an entrepot in relation to maritime relations with other Asian cities. So the status of cities such as um, Malacca, Penang, Makassar, Timor, came not from battles over territorial gain, but from commercial alliances through a very extensive far-flung network of market centers that Western trading companies were very able later to align themselves with. And in many cases, of course, these evolved into the first colonial outposts. In fact, colonial intervention in Asia from the 16th century to halfway through the 20th century was a colossal factor in the generation of city form, political, cultural transformation, and also metropolitan development. Western imperialism um, laid out the, the foundations really for some of the largest cities in Asia and was responsible for major migrations of labor, new physical configurations and essentially also a new capitalist order. Colonial policy of one kind or another prompted um, new social and economic trajectories um, that still, I think it's fair to say, resonate in contemporary urban situations. These were fashioned from the driving forces of maritime trade, religion, exploration. Um, indigenous indigenous um, cultural institutions in general were absorbed rather than subordinated. Um, but from the mid 16th century, really the result over several centuries, almost up to now was a, a transformation of urban form. During this, what we might call the mercantile period, new urban centers were developed first by the Spanish in Intramuros, the present day Manila, the Portuguese in Goa, Malacca and Macau, the Dutch in Batavia, now of course um, Jakarta, the French in um, Indochina, uh, and the British in the Indian subcontinent, the Strait settlements and most of the concession areas uh, around the Chinese coast in the mid 19th century. So these have all come to represent some of the largest, mainly port cities in Asia. Colonization was not just a Western prerogative, of course, Chinese rule predominated in. Vietnam for several centuries. Um, Japan annexed uh, Korea in 1910, causing Seoul in the process to lose much of its historical fabric after 1945. And after that, to adopt a, a much new restoration of modernizing agenda. New patterns of architecture and urban design emerged as Western planners laid out cities, um, sometimes really quite alien to their, to their previous existence, neo-Gothic, neoclassical styles, reconstructing and reconnecting older cities um, to serve, obviously, colonizing forceful interests. In some situations, architects and engineers did attempt to marry Western layouts with indigenous ones, um, 
but often they were only marginally associated with the culture of the indigenous city. Uh, in India, for example, the styles that always amuse me really, the styles came to be known as Bombay Gothic, Calcutta Corinthian and Bengal Baroque, nothing much to do with uh, some of the wonderful old uh, established Indian architecture. So in the post-colonial metropolis, what do we draw from this? Well, I think in most Asian countries, the state assumes a major role really in, in transforming urban space but also in delivering some of its more symbolic qualities. Sacred sites do continue. Um, I'm writing a chapter of the book at the moment on, on this particular subject. They do continue to focus largely on spiritual association, but they do have a large bearing on educational and environmental factors. The city, the temple in Asia is very much part of the city heritage, interweaving the, the kind of spiritual with the city's industrial and business priorities. And where the, I suppose one might say, the, 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 the essential importance of ritual forms a lingering empathy with the community itself. But Asian cities over the last 70 years have been in transition. Cities that tradition, trans, traditionally acted as gateways for material export and product delivery um, are now um, vehicles for global influences, global ideologies. New forms of capital growth are creating um, requirements for new types of urban space, such as container ports, exhibition and conference centers, cruise terminals, uh, each with distinctive urban design representations and, and place identities. Um, as Edward Sojo has reminded us in, in post-metropolis, density is no longer the central marker of centrality. City regions are being assembled with multiple realms of concentration along new growth corridors, and this is breaking down the older distinction between rural and urban. Um, around 60% of national GDP in Asia is now produced um, not just in metropolitan, but really mega urban regions that are tending to double their populations every 50 years. China's greater Bay Area that uh, I think Peter referred to before is being consolidated within the Pearl River Delta. It encompasses 10 cities as well as two special administrative regions on Hong Kong and Macau. And as the GBA is on Hong Kong's doorstep and linked by major high, highways, uh, high-speed rail and bridge connections, this is arguably going to form part of the world's largest horizontal metropolis. It's already developing into a megapolitan development corridor of more than 60 million people in 300,000 square kilometers. And projections are for this to double over the next 30 years. China's 14th national five-year plan announced just a couple of months ago has expressed support for the role Hong Kong can play in the development of the Bay area. Uh, through major cooperation platforms. In fact, the physical, economic, and social future of Hong Kong is going to be irrevocably linked to the GBA. But also elsewhere in Asia, individual cities are consolidating into directional corridors. We have the Tokyo Yokohama region of around 55 million people, the Beijing Tianjin Tangshan corridor of around 36 million. The Shanghai Hangzhou Ningpo region at about 30 to 40 million. Seoul Taejeon region, South Korea, 44 million. And the Greater Taipei Council Corridor, 17 million. But there are problems to overcome. The issue of contestation um, does represent, I think, a realm of uncertainty brought about by conflicting priorities. Uh, these priorities are related to aspects such as conservation, maximization, maximization of land value, heritage, and housing needs, and of course, competition between Asian countries. And much of this is related to the way in which established traditions do tend to collide with political conditions and less than determinate economic futures. Can I have just one more minute, uh, Hendrik? I know you're worthy of me. Um, and this essentially requires careful moderation of, uh, as to the rate of economic change. Um, the sense of dissonance common to the traditional city therefore still remains in Asia. Um, it's one of interaction and encounter. It's one about the complex and the informal, the bizarre economy that's traditionally evolved around marketplaces, 
mobile vendors, specialized trades and products associated with active streets and indigenous cultural institutions in areas that don't have to meet increasingly high operational specifications. Persistence is still carried through, and I think they're very important when we look at city development over the design and planning, the sacred places, the gathering places, temple and palace compounds, speciality markets together with indigenous mixed use portals. These represent what we might call the, the calls of complexity in the cities that characterize older neighborhoods um, where different interest groups compete for priority and space to, to overlap and layering. And in these situations, the relationship between architecture and city, city space becomes pretty well overwhelmed by forces that have actually very little to do with design or with expressive qualities. Um, so it's necessary to look hard, but simple, sympathetically at our contested environments, because many of the problems that we do will encounter uh, in terms of both social and economic issues. So this is the Asian urban future, just as it's Hong Kong's future. We'll have to live with it and perhaps continue to contribute to it. I, I could go a little bit further on to aspects and strengths on which to build on, but I'll Thank draw you. the line there. You're at least but, today. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, because also time's up, but uh, thanks very much, Peter, for um, your presentation and, and also linking that back to really to the kind of much wider time horizon, right? Uh, how, how this region evolved uh, and also linking it uh, to your own biography, right? Um, thanks very much. Um, we come to the last presentation, which is by uh, John, um, John Chang, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, so, um, hey, John Chang is um, basically oh. born, yeah. as I understand, here in the PRD, right? So he's really somebody yeah. who's very mm -hmm. familiar firsthand, uh, 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 as somebody growing up in the area uh, and then uh, moved on to, to Europe and other places uh, for his um, education. <clears throat> but um, uh, opened the office O office uh, architects, which um, then uh, also received a whole series of, of important awards. Um, and uh, I would say without further ado, uh, we can start with your presentation, which is titled The Ruin Project. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Hansrek. I'm going to share my uh, screen. Uh, yeah, can you see the screen? Yeah, you can just no, make it full, thank you. full screen, maybe. Can you can you change it? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, um, uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm an uh, architect based in Guangzhou. So already introduced. Uh, yeah. I'm very happy to have the chance to make presentation here. I'm quite enjoying uh, all the panelists' presentation with the uh, biggest scale of territory because I'm architect and going to jump into a more micro scale and more concrete action to uh, present how uh, we work directly in the uh, urban context of the Greater Bay, the, the Porua Delta area. And um, the title is Rum, but uh, I, I think everybody is curious how you stay in a growing, fast growing development and how the, the, the title or the architectural practice relates to rooms. And this is the greater bay we, we, we have now. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the right side, we have the uh, original uh, geography of the, the so we, we can see most of the land actually uh, land, uh, taken from the sea uh, during the history. And because why? The title, the the, uh, the action is related to to rain. This is the, the ordinary daily scenery we have uh, we have viewed in the in the city. So the new generation is always uh, create rooms or kind of a, a, a cooling condition to the early generation of the the city. 
but as an architect born in this region, I always remind us, me or our team that we should looking at this uh, original city, original horizontality of the city and try to make link with the uh, kind of uh, old condition and the uh, future uh, desire of development for the region. And uh, I think almost everybody uh, in the city have experienced moving from their old house into the higher skyscraper to making their home into a small uh, cube unit uh, in the sky. And um, sometimes I think there is a big gap in between the uh, architectural project, uh, uh, practice and the planning because uh, in this case, because the planning would like to widen the street and they just kind of a brutal action that to cut one of the street building into half and remain the other half. But at this time, I'm fascinated with the, this internal to, to explosion of internal condition of the building because that really reflecting the real life of underneath that big uh, scenery of uh, 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 dens the densification, uh, the, the density of the uh, hyper city. And um, so we make ourselves kind of laboratory, our studio kind of laboratory into this room condition. So uh, six years ago, we found a very interesting silo building and we moved our studio on top of them of the silo, it can kind of vacant industrial area. And um, the, this is our first project, uh, commission project uh, eight years ago. Uh, and we transformed um, vacant and roomed uh, industrial building into a gallery, art gallery. That's the first project. So that, is, that project actually is a starter point of our kind of continuously uh, room uh, intervention project into uh, our the, the, the so-called Greater Bell area. And in 2013, um, we collaborate with uh, Ole Bowman and other architects to together to transform a former uh, glass factory in Sherco to the UABB site in that year. I think uh, for, for a long time, our office has been working on that kind of uh, I think the industry room is kind of in the edge or under the risk of demolition. So we're always working under this risk and try to rescue and try to expand this territory, kind of transformed territory to get to re to, to a kind of counter action to the uh, urban sprawl of the city. So uh, the the we have to, some of our, our pro project, a kind of long-term project. We highlight a few kinds of long-term, not kind of a one-time invest and one-time uh, uh, construction. So uh, since 2014, we have the chance to uh, work on the Honghua factory in East Shenzhen, in uh, uh, near the coast factory. This is the, uh, on the right side is the factory's plan and on the other side is the kind of uh, acropolis in Adam. We try to put them together in the same scale and try to understand the uh, potential and quality of the uh, room, uh, uh, industrial room uh, site. And this is a, a videotape when we, the first time we enter the uh, vacant industrial site to, it, it, what fascinates us is the uh, relationship between the invention, intervention of the plantation and the rain condition. And we have this very beautiful scenery inside. And that is the kind of uh, mixing, missing thing in our urban, uh, new urban life in the um, new city. So we try to maintain that condition and try to have kind of light intervention into the site. And uh, what's specific to this history, uh, to this factory is there are very uh, hidden history that uh, the first general manager of this uh, Shenzhen factory is uh, one of the, pri uh, the vice prime, uh, pri prime minister during the rev revolution at the cultural revolution uh, age 
So he was invited from by Shenzhen government to uh, kind of managing to manage this new factory. That's the first intervention for us to intervene to this uh, industrial room to have kind of uh, uh, new artistic uh, cases just right sit straightly on top of the room uh, landscape. And years later, this uh, place become kind of uh, 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 kind of meeting point for all the residents in the, uh, in the industrial zone. And the second project is kind of uh, uh, art gallery space into the largest uh, uh, packaging, uh, uh, packaging workshop space, and also the entry landscape intervention to the side. And uh, uh, three years later, we have a very um, a unexpected chance that um, an education foundation was interesting to uh, erect a school campus in, inside uh, to, to make use of the rest of the uh, other buildings to form a new uh, private school, high school project. So what we did here is to try to create kind of intermediate uh, uh, connection or public uh, uh, realms, this is a public uh, scope space to link of all the scattered buildings on the side. The, all the buildings have different uh, uh, um, elevations scattered on the side. That's the result. That's the daily life of the new campus. and the dormitory and have the forest ramp connecting the uh, living quarter to the uh, teaching quarter. So the classroom, the library and the sport facility. Yeah. yeah, in the end, oh, we put together the uh, school campus and the uh, artist zone together. It's kind of became a new sort of uh, police condition. Uh, far away from the city center. So here uh, the, 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 there are young people and also artists gathering together in a very interesting uh, new commune. And uh, the second project I would like to present is uh, we uh, collaborate with a curator to build a very small uh, contemporary art museum in remote city in Northern Guangzhou. <laughs> That's the uh, city. Right. So the old city still having the traditional life. It's, it's just the memory of my childhood that we uh, from the uh, 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 Guangzhou and other uh, Shenzhen city, uh, Yang Liayang. But the old town already in kind of uh, semi uh, run condition. Only old people remain in the city, younger people, younger generation moving out from the old town. Right. So lots of building uh, collapsing. So now we uh, try to build this uh, a small, very small art museum directly into this old town to uh, keep one of the original uh, storage building and then build a new shape of the new uh, wing of the museum. But we try to have the decentralized the uh, exhibition space into small clusters uh, to have kind of iso isomorphic uh, structure to the neighborhood. So at the same time, uh, because of very low budget, we, we need to respect. So we maintain all the material demolished from the temporary structure and try to uh, re uh, re weave the, all this material into the new, new building. 
and that's the uh, entry courtyard, a kind of reception, opening reception for the museum. You, you see the whole museum, internal museum, kind of a uh, sectional uh, uh, combination. It's not the kind of very formal, but kind of uh, experiencing space in general. That's the uh, uh, plans and section uh, directly linked to the uh, city. There's also small movie for the result of the construction. It's a um, um, photographic museum um, because the, the small town has already have a very interesting um, a photographic event for many years in a small town. So we would also like to have this project as kind of a regenerator for the old downtown. It's, it, to, to me, it's becoming kind of really uh, interesting encounter from the contemporary art and the local uh, urban condition. In the Louvre, we have this public space as well. Have opening a theater and lecture during the evening. And uh, the third one, uh, we, we I'm going to go in fast, a little bit fast. It's in central Guangzhou. It's two uh, warehouses, uh, vacant warehouse condition. So we uh, one curve. This client is one curve. We try to work together to transform these two warehouses into a kind of. Uh, uh, mixing a commute, uh, living and working together. What we try to have, we just try to have also this kind of internal section condition to have landscape to directly link between these two buildings, create kind of uh, uh, a new uh, way of urbanization, kind of integrate with ecology and kind of the plantation uh, condition see this section to link between two buildings. That's the, uh, uh, the street underneath this bridge, the vertical gardens and landscape, and the living quarter for the building. In the end, this form uh, another new uh, uh, society, I think new commune, new society for the younger uh, gen uh, people who are just entering the city. Uh, the last project I would like to show here is um, uh, a regeneration of uh, uh, old, a state-owned uh, tea mill in Fosan, a suburb of Fosan. And um, there used to be a very large tea farm in the uh, 50s and 60s. And, but now uh, the production already moved away and the tea, uh, the tea factory already vacant for years. So um, what we do here is try to have some uh, uh, several actions. First action, try to repair the tea farm uh, inside the island. And the second action is try to build kind of a new uh, uh, podium, a secular podium that to uh, re -def definite, redefine the territory of the, the farm at the mill. And on the other, we have the kind of top a pavilion that's to create another layer level that people can enjoy the landscape and the view of the city. That is a result of the podium and the, the two layers interventions into the, uh, the, the original building. And also the building itself work as kind of infrastructure, both for the visitors and for the, the farmers. Yeah. That's the uh, space, the new podium, and also in the old uh, buildings. That's uh, we try to regenerate the production for the tea. That's the section that we create for the new uh, uh, tea mill. That's uh, the construction, both as the stone and the bamboo. That's also two materials related to tea culture. Yeah, all the vegetation on the side we, 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 we respect and to try to incorporate them into um, new scenery of uh, 
um, that's what we try to have kind of uh, another kind of uh, expansion, another kind of develop development to kind of new um, testimony to the kind of generic expansion, generic urban spread of the Po River Delta. Thank you for the attention. Thanks so much for this uh, very beautiful presentation. Uh, 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 um, it's very, very touching to see this kind of quality of work and, and I hope that at some point we can travel again on the other side <laughs> because the movement is, is just so complicated and to, to really catch up with all this yeah, kind yeah. Of, uh, beautiful new work. Um, I think it's, it's very interesting no, to have this uh, presentation because you're uh, taking us basically on ground level no, in this uh, region uh, which we discussed in the other uh, presentations and and uh, which in I think in, yeah. in their work usually they also work uh, not only in this kind of uh, top-down big, uh, big plan uh, view but also on other uh, perspectives but uh, I think from the presentations today really uh, take us to to the experience of the space also using the video and so on. and uh, but also engage with this transformation process and try to somehow make sense of or or, or um, engage with this transformation uh, process in a constructive way. You know? And then also in the last project, also um, I think beyond the architecture, uh, also looking at the, um, the landscape compo component, I, I don't know how much you were also engaging uh, uh, with this discussion of, of, of tea production and so on there, but uh, certainly there is this kind of relationship to the landscape uh, also. No? Um, anyway, um, I think we still have uh, around 20 minutes uh, for discussion uh, if we follow the, the given time. Um, Andrea? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, to add a comment uh, after having uh, seen all of these uh, very engaging and wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, um, especially uh, starting perhaps from Peter Cookson's Mead. Um, and uh, it, it seems to, to be clear that uh, in the Chinese context, especially, there are many, many historical re reasons to, which keep uh, um, over the decades a kind of a dualism, which is sometimes turned into a dichotomy. But this is also based on, on other ceremony symbologies, and also, of course, this uh, kind of um, overlapping uh, imposition in terms of policies on, on, this, on the context, on the space, especially when we look at mega urban regions. However, through all of this presentation, what, what uh, uh, it came to me is uh, the resilience of these uh, um, liminal and uh, interstitial spaces, which are operating progressively as a catalyst of a new dimensional uh, uh, project. And, uh, and in this sense, it's linked up with um, with the fact that uh, in the horizontal metropolis discourse, the open space is, is in fact the real agent of transformation. Is the, is the agent that is capable to reorganize, restructuring uh, several activities and especially uh, social, ecological uh, relation on the territory. And um, perhaps it would be interesting if you have any comments about that. And uh, I would also say that in my opinion, the, 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 the work of Cheng uh, Shen is, uh, is uh, really fascinating because it seems to have a new voc vocabulary uh, to, to, to the emergence of a new narrative, a spatial narrative in uh, this context, starting from open spaces and the resilience and resistance of these open spaces to a um, uh, progressive, if you want, transformation enacted by megalopolis. Uh, in the megalopolis itself, we can found uh, this uh, counter narrative which are giving a progressive, uh, um, let's say, responsibility and authority to architect and designer to link social and spatial relations in that context. So th thank you. Thank you very much once again. And if you have any comments about it, I would be very happy to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, well, I, I, I can't come. Can, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I think I think you I think you bring out some good points there, really, because there is this really enormous 
transition from the city to the metropolitan region and from the metropolitan region to the mega region. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it's very difficult with the latter two. We can talk about the city, we can talk about, you know, areas of regeneration. We do need to essentially build on the actual characteristics inherent in most, in most Asian cities, but I suppose the same criteria, you know, applies to European and American cities. Um, but here, you know, with, with, with a new Asian urbanism that's been built on the back of the old, I think it is obviously important to assimilate what is kind of characteristically embodied in the local morphology with, with the essential values of, 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 the, of the city, you know, the street, the street margin, the city block, the local space configurations. Um, I seem to be speaking a bit like a new urbanist here, but I mean, I think all these factors are really quite important. You know, they're, they're like a baseline, how these could be then translated into planning and urban design typologies that satisfy changing community structures with high density and, and climatically suitable morphologies. And that really, you know, these sustain what we most admire in cities, the, cosm the cosmopolitan types of urban regime. And we do need to encourage an urbanism when we're talking about you know, metropolitan areas of high adaptability. We've got to absorb change and flexibility as necessary measures of use and variety that are kind of embedded in the complex framework of everyday life. You know, so we're, we're, we're absorbing the life and tradition and characteristics of cities at the same time as we're moving towards you know, this nebulous area in the future where you know, in the mega region, how do we differentiate between you know, strategic development policy and you know, lo localities? Um, reading, reading a book on new urbanism uh, um, uh, just the other day, it seemed that you know, a lot of writers on that are making exactly the same points, even in Western cities as well. But I think you know, some of the issues here are much more complicated. Thank you. Hey, Zheng Shan, do, do you have any comments about it? Is that poetic of contemporary spaces that are emerging through your work? Um, I think I think uh, you make a very good comment uh, on my work because um, uh, actually I had um, both uh, education in China and in uh, Europe. I I, I studied in Kaiu Leuven for. Uh, yeah, after two years of my graduation from China, and then I did I did do some uh, urban design studio in Gao Leuven. So that's why uh, that's why I always looking. Even though I'm doing small scale a project, building an architecture project, but uh, the background, the grand background, is always the city. And 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 even I try to, I really. Uh, appreciate your idea of like kind of progressing and a new cat category. That's the uh, feeling because I born from this area, I raised from this area. We're always seeing this uh, urbanization is a is a whole process. It's a bro on on processing uh, 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 action. So it's always always continuous. No starting, no end. You, it, there's no. So what I do is all. The, the, the methodology we, we work in our office is always looking at this is kind of a processing thing. So we try to understand the, 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 uh, the processing uh, in, before, and then we try to uh, re imagine the processing after work and try to make links in between, in between these two things and try to uh, kind of intervene and also try to kind of adjusting the processing in the grander, grander scale. Maybe sometimes it's not working, but uh, for many cases, I think it working. We we rescue many this many many uh, this kind of uh, industrial side, industrial building, and people love it, and people like to. Uh, uh, um, to live and work inside the space. And then I think generally that the site itself and try to, um, to, 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 to affect or to, to, to make 
affect you to, to the surrounding. And, and then it become kind of, uh, in the beginning, maybe it's kind of an oasis or island. And in the end, it, the ecology, the sociology, maybe can grow a little bit away. I think that's uh, what we would like to have because we're born here, we have the emotion, we have memory, and we try to maintain this not having uh, I hate the condition I hate the condition that the city are uh, hitting nowhere hitting somewhere we don't we, we have no idea that's a thing but I, maybe that's a chance but I think we need to have some some kinds of other other kind of counter action to maintain the balance in the chain thing. Mm. Okay. thank you thank you very much thank you Maybe um, I, I follow up on this and, and maybe I, I just turn back also to you again for, uh, uh, for one more uh, question, uh, seeing your work, but also maybe the others can also comment on this in a, in a larger uh, uh, context, uh, because <clears throat> I think that, that uh, uh, it's, it's very beautiful to see your work and it is, Fantastic, you can succeed with this. On the other hand, I, I, I'm very interested how you manage also to get the clients on board or what are the circumstances that allow those projects like the first one, for example, where a whole area was basically transformed to, to become a new school and so on, which is, is fantastic. Uh, if a similar site would exist in Hong Kong, uh, uh, probably we would <laughs> know more or less how it would develop, right? So, uh, so I think uh, maybe also the, uh, the GBA, maybe because there's a bit more space, uh, more other things possible. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how, how the relationship to a client then is that, that actually allows those things to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and then afterwards, I don't know if the others also want to comment on this, like uh, the, the bigger question of how we intervene as, uh, because you are on one hand, all scholars, uh, but also you're teaching design and, and you, you are also reflecting about how we can interact with those kind of conditions that are often shaped really by much larger processes, and um, and which I think there is also this one question on uh, the the river regeneration, the, the models for that, and how that can happen. Maybe Alita Johnny, you can also uh, allude to that uh, or, or further explain to this, uh, because I believe anyway we don't have so much time maybe for uh, uh, comments, but I think this this might be a, a very fundamental question for, for all of you, you know, like how to engage with this kind of reality and create qualities on the ground, right? For, for communities and so on in this kind of context while addressing, if possible, also some of these kind of larger uh, circumstances or ecological questions also. No? So maybe and, um, Ka Chang, you can start and then maybe we can- Yeah, I, I just start a little bit uh, on, on this issue. And uh, of course, if for us, uh, we erected our office uh, uh, almost 14 years ago. At the moment in Guangzhou, there are almost no independent architects uh, in the city. So, but we are, we were, uh, both me and Ying, uh, we uh, study and work uh, in Europe. So we're familiar with the working way of European architects. They used to working in very small studio and, mm -hmm. and have good relationship with the client and then they can, uh, develop their career. So we just, at the moment, we leave, we both left from a bigger corporation, design corporation, because we are a little bit tired <laughs> with that way of working with big, uh, uh, big uh, institution, big developers. So we try to re restructure and try to make an experiment, actually, to start from very small, very three, four people. And in the beginning, we just work with very closely close friends, like the, the small gallery, small uh, renovation project. And later, because we uh, show we have this this project, so uh, developers are looking are coming to to talk to us. But we always try to negotiate with them to try to have a, a to 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 the modify their program because they asked us to work, to do a kind of a, in a creative part. We just work, work, try to help them. But on the other hand, uh, most of this project, which the, uh, the, the developer look at us is, is kind of difficult one. It's not a typical one. 
because for typical they have the routine the partner that can, we can work the difficult they use this chance we try to modify that program to try to have the program more fit to our our uh, 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 calendar so that kind of uh, negotiation because we keep our the, the our 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 strength is we are small we don't need so many projects we just need three four projects is enough in there. that's our strength so we we have the the, <laughs> the thing that we can negotiate so slowly by slowly we'll have bigger and bigger projects that's that's the only way i think for independent architecture work on a bigger scale to try to realize bigger dream for the city yeah it looks as if you almost invent your own projects really <laughs> Little I mean, bit like I, I, I found it very interesting, really, you know, this in, in interesting regenerative intervention, industrial archaeology, you know, it, it, it's, it's this sort of contrast between the technology and the bling of Shenzhen and, and, and the need to understand the sort of complexity between, you know, the, the new techno culture and, and the residue, if you like. So, you yeah. know, by integrating these interventions you know you're, you're you're sort of articulating a, a kind of counterculture in a way <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, that's the, i think I we know. we lie the condition of working in between to try to keep mm -hmm. distance from the mainstream market mainstream yes, yeah. value that's yes. the trend also that's the thing i learned from europe <laughs> I thought Peter Peter uh, had a uh, uh, Peter Hassel, uh, uh, had had a comment. Yeah. Yes. Um, just one one thing to note. I mean, you know, of course, with uh, Peter Cooks and Smith's comments, you know, I can't really evaluate how much this will happen. But clearly, I mean, GBA maybe um, in the end not so much monolithic, but actually much more uh, influenced by uneven development in a way moving ahead, particularly considering, you know, things like Evergrande's, you know, recent crises and things like this and the speculative model of land sales, how much they will impact all the cities in GBA and other places in China. We don't really know. So th therefore, you know, your office's approach is actually highly, you know, could be yeah. highly relevant moving ahead in the future because it's, you know, if you look at, I don't know, whatever cement factory or, or well, those other places like in Shenzhen, you know, the Conquer TV factory that is now uh, uh, whatever it's called, you know, it's like a creative hub, right? The cycle of these things is much less than it was in the West, perhaps, you know, so the, the use cycle for a cement factory might be, I don't know, in Guangzhou or where your office is, but maybe it's 20 or 30 years instead of 40 or 50, perhaps how it might have been before. So clearly there will be some uh, need for some new models, both of architecture and planning, that is not simply the tabula rasa maximized floor area GFA uh, model of, of Chinese developer to the development, or on the other hand, the kind of infrastructural um, led development um, procedures that have characterized uh, GBA and other places. So, you know, how, how those models actually play into planning, both planning urban planning and also architecture, I think it's very, very interesting in the coming next 20 odd years or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny, um, maybe uh, because there is this one question also now on the river regeneration and the models for that, right? Uh, I think maybe we, it's also linked to the discussion that we have, but then basically just going uh, scale wise now in, into the next scale, uh, in, in engaging with this kind of more regional infrastructure now of, of ecologic systems and so on, how we can engage with those kind of very fundamental questions also, right? Uh, do you want to comment on this? Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you for, uh, for giving the floor. The, uh, well, to answer to you, you Kong, if I understand well the question, uh, I feel that there are a lot of ongoing projects, some of them very famous, uh, Seoul, um, of course, Singapore, and uh, it, as well as Guangzhou, we have the Guangzhou Creek, uh, as well as Shenzhen, but they are kind of 
common uh, in the sense, the sort of commonalities in the sense that uh, they all look very urban. They look, all look uh, uh, in their design, uh, they're trying to promote a sort of urban kind of lifestyle and they, they work as sort of linear parks. Uh, what I try to uh, put forward with my research is an attention to other aspects that exist on ground. Uh, they are not like my own uh, aims. They are also my own aims, but they exist. We actually capture them from, from the ground, which are actually agricultural related uses of spaces within the river or around the rivers. And uh, to promote a different kind of model, uh, which is not just uh, a sort of urban linear park, but it's a productive landscape in which people engage and interact uh, on a daily basis uh, in, a, in a different way, in a more productive way. So bringing back a linking to the tradition of these places as at a different scale, uh, Zheng Shang is doing, for instance. So um, yeah, that uh, if I don't know if I answer uh, enough to uh, to you, Sung. And uh, uh, yeah, I I also agree with the, with Andrew's comment on on the fact that well, we are all designer here. So at the end of the day, we're all fascinated with the Jiang Shang work because we we really like want to make change uh, on a daily uh, life of people by transforming uh, the physical environment. And I was fascinated by his work many years ago already. I, I just wrote extensively in, in a book of mine about D.D. Town. <laughs> it was extremely fascinated by that project when I was in Xinjiang and then as well in Venice. You've been working in Venice at Zen as well. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I appreciate a lot what you are doing. And, uh, but I, I, um, I have a question to uh, Zheng Shang and I also have a question to Peter uh, Hasdal, um, if we have little time. To Zheng Shang, I would, um, I would like to answer um, the role of growing in a sort of um, Piranesi uh, understanding of it. Um, so there was a, a lecture uh, a few weeks, a few months ago at the European Architecture History Network um, conference uh, by uh, Caroline van Eck on uh, uh, both um, Piranesi, uh, Semter, and uh, Abi Warburg. And while the, the city, uh, the Per River Delta and the Greater Bay Area uh, looks to me like a sort of Abi Warburg, uh, large scale, um, some uh, con collection of pieces, right? Um, at a smaller scale, uh, what what uh, uh, Zhang Shang is doing is in a way to me much more related to Piranesi and the role of nature. Mm -hmm. When I was inside, uh, become extremely important in recent years there. When I was inside ED town, I, it was, I didn't have the feeling of uh, like a sort of uh, architecture that uh, created a, a framework for life, but so uh, in which life is somehow surrounded by building uh, but uh, other ways around in which you are exposed to nature. Nature is coming into the building, right? And then uh, when you're living into this building and spending time there, more than uh, interacting with others, you, you feel a strong connection with the natural environment. And I feel a lot of uh, their project has this value that brings a strong connection between natural environment, whatever it is, uh, and and. Uh, uh, so I would like uh, to comment, uh, to hear a comment on that. And to Peter Astle, if I can, um, I was fascinated by the notion of Cora. I actually gave a lecture uh, to at uh, CUHK on this some time ago, Andrew was attending it. Uh, the, uh, the notion of Cora for Derrida and the idea of this undefined space outside the, the city boundary at the, already at the Greek time, right? Uh, so uh, you were talking about speculative uh, approach on that, but to me, uh, what you're doing is much more than a speculation. Uh, you're trying to really fill up uh, this void, this undefined space uh, that needs some sort of uh, uh, identification more than identity uh, with new values. And I think this, this work is, I mean, is an astonishingly important, uh, particularly at the, uh, at the educational level, because uh, it brings once more uh, new uh, ideas 
uh, on on uh, on ground there. So uh, I would like to hear a comment on that as well, if we have time. Up to Hendrik. <laughs> Well, it's not. Uh, I just follow the instructions that were given to me by by the organizers, right? Um, yeah. Well, maybe so, I can just respond quickly and then leave yeah. some time for Zhang Shang. Yeah. But you, you know, very briefly, I cut it out of my presentation. But Cora, as was set up, was actually based on the Greek word, right? Koros, uh, which, as we know, is a kind of space of becoming. You know, the 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 kind of place between Athens and Piraeus that, that actually would be activated partly through annual festival or seasonal festival, where the, the city almost goes crazy in a way. It, it sort of reconfigures itself uh, through ritual sim symbolic uh, enactment that, that gives birth back to the relationships between those very important parts. So if, if we go back to the sort of you know, the civic idea that, that Peter Cooks and Smith was talking about. I mean, this is actually essential to that. So the city is not simply morphology, it's not simply typology or uh, uh, aggregation of a commercial space or, you know, GFA and how much you can sell, like the Hong Kong model and so on. But it has to involve that sort of civitas in a way. So Cora for us was really about that sort of, uh, not enactment so much, but the, the sort of integration of the sort of the, that physical place together with those kind of uh, that civitas, that, that group of people in, in whatever capacity they are. So if it's in Soviet Union and the, the, the whole system has collapsed, they no longer have a job, they no longer have money, you know, how do the, the patterns of how they operate enable that to, to change, to survive, to, to manage? manifest and so you know for me uh, I think we lost Peter oh. Peter mm -hmm. I think maybe we can move to so maybe yeah maybe we can uh, Zhang Shang do you want to jump in and maybe uh, reply to Johnny about the relationship of nature yeah. and to your buildings and so on, and then maybe we can see with yeah. Peter as well. Yeah. I just would like to, yeah, I have a very soon fast uh, answer. Uh, I think the strength of the space came from the original building, not, I, I don't think we create, I create, we create that. Uh, I always believe that the, um, uh, the uh, when we do renovation project, we can what we can do is to just to try to uh, strengthen strengthen the spirit, a spiritual uh, feeling or spirit the spirit of the original space is not to change to try to strengthen and try to make the, the to uh, adjust the scale of the building to try to have that scale the scale for human not for machine. That's the only thing we can do. For all the others, I think we try to remain the natural relationship with the site and the nature and all that is existing is not by new intervention. So, um, and on the other hand, I think uh, industrial space be more and more becoming the only space that we can uh, repair the kind of ritual or spiritual uh, 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 feeling or space for the city because we now we all have this standardized uh, cube standard office living so we that's the only way or uh, in the end I think it become kind of space for a little bit for uh, enlightenment uh, uh, effect for the people for the people who live and work there yeah thank you I think that no, uh, Andrea, you were saying there's one more question. Uh, yes, from uh, Chen Yunha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Chen, please, um, you, you can ask the question if you want. Are you able to unmute your microphone? Okay. Okay. Uh, Chen uh, Junhao, uh, you still have a question because we can see your hand raised, but I think the hand was also raised right at the beginning, I think quite early, right? Yeah. So, Meanwhile, we have Peter back. 
I'm sorry. Yes, uh, my yeah. my computer crashed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe uh, Chen, you need to uh, unmute your microphone, uh, or the host should unmute the microphone from for Chen. If if you still have a question, because I think yes. the hand was up uh, right at the beginning. I'm not sure if that's still okay. Because if not, I think we are basically five minutes over time already, right? Um, maybe otherwise we could also, uh, if there's not a, another question from the audience, um, I would say maybe we can also close this wonderful session, uh, seeing that there will be a second one at 5 p.m., right? Um, and uh, so uh, in my role as moderator, I want to thank all the uh, fantastic speakers uh, and of course, uh, Johnny and Andrea to, for organizing uh, this opportunity. I think uh, it was very fascinating to see basically how uh, basically in, in many of, of your work or our works, uh, of course, the, the, the wider territory of Hong Kong and the GBA uh, is kind of important for our work <laughs> and, uh, and to see uh, those different approaches huh, from ecology, different time layers to then architectural interventions uh, um, with the existing structures and so on uh, um, come together. Uh, very, uh, very nice thing to see. And uh, I hope we anyway will continue probably uh, this discourse in various uh, reviews with students and with, with uh, looking at your work uh, at the different institutions and also in practice and uh, just continue uh, probably soon again uh, in, in similar composition, right? Uh, so thanks very much. And uh, um, yeah, I want to invite all the attendees to, to join also the uh, afternoon session. And uh, also today still the exhibition uh, can be seen in City Gallery. Is that correct? Anything? Okay. Otherwise, Andrea and, and Tony, do you want to any, any additions as uh, organizers? Uh, I would like to, to really thank everyone for your commitment, your time and for really bringing together so many interesting possibilities you know, to further discuss on the subject related on the horizontality and the future of our region. Uh, either European or, 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 or in the Greater Bay Area. And uh, I will meet you soon with the next seminar and uh, hopefully in the future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. 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 Great to see you. Great work. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.